All right, everyone. We're here for another Friday afternoon talk recording on reinforcing learning from human feedback. As usual, I'm trying to re-record any talk that I give in a closed forum. This one was from a workshop on social choice for AI ethics and safety, where really the focus was trying to understand how to make a technique like reinforcement learning from human feedback, where you're aggregating human preferences more democratic and liberal by understanding how to aggregate preferences in a, what some might call effective or fair or unbiased manner. Really, we're going to talk about the things you should know about the history of reinforcement learning and human feedback. It's a kind of intentional, clever title here, follows a paper that I'll put as a link in the description. So to start, RLHF, this meme is surprisingly apt. I've used it in other talks in the past. Reinforcement learning from human feedback was the last necessary component to make something like ChatGPT a reality, but it's cover covering up a lot of unknowns in the language models about how preferences are handled, about what it means to be human. Even just the fact that we don't know how these models work is overshadowed by the fact that they are now easy to use. And this is the focus of the talk. Something that we should know in relation to this meme is that RLHF is not even robust to fine tuning. We've seen many papers in the last few months removing the RLHF safety later, layer from openly fine tunable models. This works in GPT-4, this works in Llama 2. Just a few fine tuning examples make it so this notion of RLHF as kind of a metaphor for safety breaks down. And this sort of thin layer in the compute, probably due to the fact that way fewer flops are used in the RLHF phase, that's the like floating point operations, how much compute it is. It's a, it's a thin layer. There's not, it's not robust right now, but it represents a lot for these models. To start, here are the different branches that really made us converge on RLHF. The gray arrows are implicit links to multiple fields, where these are kind of things that inspired other fields. So you can see the earliest links are from philosophy. I've referenced Aristotle's work in works on RLHF, that's over 2000 years ago, and then things like psychology and economics and decision theory. But the core techniques really came out of this deep learning and this optimal control work in these areas that are both from around the 1950s, 1940s, and they grew into reinforced learning, deep RL, language models, and everything like this. But this shows the basic complexity that you need to internalize if you're going to consider working on RLHF. To study and to build RLHF implicitly means that you're building on these other fields, and you should understand what the assumptions implicit to your work are with respect to other worldviews. At a technical level, RLHF is about reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a feedback mechanism. You can see an agent interacting with an environment and getting a reward. This implies the core functionalities of feedback and the core functionalities of trial and error learning. Exploration, not going to talk about the technical side too much in this talk, but this is also essential to understanding where RLHF is going. Because it led into the early works of RLHF. Reinforcement learning from human feedback really started in the decision making realm. Before DeepRL, there were multiple works. This is just one of them called Tamer that I highlight in most of my talks, where a human assigned a score from zero to one to every action. It assigned the, it, it was the reward function. And then even without deep learning methods, you could use this reward model that humans gave basic scalars, no comparisons yet, to, to be used in an agent. And then the popular paper, the Cristiano et al. Deep RL from Human Preferences paper is the first one where these kind of uh, pairwise preference models came in. So the humans were shown two trajectories. They chose the best trajectory with respect to a task. And then this trained a reward pr predictor that could take in state action data and return a scalar value. This was used by the policy to optimize um, RL control tasks, things like a walking robot, a carpool swing up, and these 
pairwise comparison of trajectories proved even more powerful than the reward signal from the environment. This is a pretty profound paper. Recommend looking at it, even if you're just working on language models today. It shows how human preferences can encompass information outside the context of a specific action or a specific word and how that kind of can change how you're approaching problems. Recommend reading it. This is where everything started from and we continue from here. In 2018, a very overlapping group of authors from this Cristiano et al. paper proposed scalable agent alignment via reward modeling. This is where reward modeling really became a thing. There was two assumptions to this paper. The first one is a little bit less core to where we are today, but not surprising if you follow the AI alignment literature, which is we can learn user intentions to a sufficiently high accuracy. It seems pretty important, but the second one is crucial to how RLHF works. For many tasks we want to solve, evaluation of outcomes is easier than producing the correct behavior. This essentially means it's easier to compare two things than it is to generate. It's easier to compare two poems than it is to generate a good poem. This is the fundamental assumption to what RLHF is built upon now, which is it's easier for humans or GPT-4 to compare two model answers to a prompt than it is for a model to level up on its own to the next set of capabilities. Quickly after this, the first in 2019 is where we first seeing the see these kind of RLHF feedback diagrams that are now popular today. This is the first paper that talks about using binary preference data on language models, using sentiment classifiers on language models, showing the dramatic effects RLHF has in 2019. If you're working in the space, you need to read this paper. Simple enough, lots of great experiments. This led to the paper everyone knows about. This led to the OpenAI summarization experiments, which was really the first paper where people went, oh crap, this is doing a ton to the language models. This is dramatically changing the style of the model. It makes it much more usable. It makes it seem like the model is more correct. And we're starting to see the impacts of RLHF in 2020. And this is almost three years later before people really realized it was a big thing. What this looks like, we have training prompts from Reddit, which are like asking to summarize a long Reddit post looking for advice. So this is about if someone should go to grad school in CS. And if you look at the base model in this paper, it's going to be repetitive. You can pause and read the text if you want to, but this is a very normal language model um, degraded behavior being repetitive. And you add additional human data to the loop. This is an example of an annotation, which is now called instruction data. And if you do this fine tuning, if you do RLHF, the outputs of the model really end up becoming much more faithful to the text you want to mirror and just much better for the use case, in this case, summarization across a variety of uh, long documents and questions. Today, everyone knows about RLHF. We have WebGPT, which is a web crawling agent that they've trained reward models for, again, OpenAI, InstructGPT, the basis of a lot of modern research questions, training instruction following model, which led to ChatGPT, and then Claude, GPT-4, Llama2, Bard, Gemini, Mixtural, these all use RLHF as a core component. Um, some of the more interesting recent ones, Gemini uses kind of a four-headed output where they have things like honesty, factuality, something and something. So it's not just one scalar reward. Llama2 does capabilities and safety. Uh, Mixtral use direct preference optimization. There's a lot going on in this space, but RLHF is relied upon. The recent history is much more transparent to people and much more studied but there's a lot more older things that we need to know and how it informs this work. So the goal of a recent paper that I did is to construct the minimum tree of methods and ideas that led to modern RLHF. And what we did essentially is we created a set of assumptions, which are theories in the creation process. So really explicit math, really explicit literature and presumptions, which are kind of tools and habits of the people building these technologies. It's not exhaustive because if you were to write every link to other fields about reinforcement learning and human feedback, it would be a gigantic textbook. You can scan the screen for the paper. It's on archive, but this is what we kind of did. And the motivating idea for people that come from non-CS backgrounds, this will make a lot of sense, is what are the kind of implicit assumptions between optimizing a cost function as people would do an optimal control optimizing a reward function as an RL and some psychology thing experiments. And then what does a preference mean? 
it links to economics. It's much more vague. I don't really think that saying you are optimizing a preference may not even be a viable assumption at all. Like you might not be able to optimize preferences. They, some people believe preferences don't exist. So how did we get here through a longer term lens? Disclaimer, this is joint work. We're not an expert on everything. Please reach out if you feel like we missed something crucial. But again, it's not an exhaustive search, but what people are using to build RLHF. So the kind of first assumption and assumption one plus is that preferences exist and that you can quantify them. There's early work from philosophers. So Arnold ever at the Port Royal logic, which is essentially starting to reason that some preferences will be good and some will be bad and you can assign probabilities to them, which was really popularized in Jeremy Bentham's hedonic calculus, which is where people started to try to compute notions of expected utility. It wasn't called that back then, but that's what it was looking like. We can quantify any preference. And then the next kind of fundamental thing is something called the von neumann morgenson utility theorem. If you're working with utility functions at all, if you're looking at utilitarianism, this assumption is, or this theorem is the fundamental piece of work that utilitarianism as like economic theory and decision theory came out of which is essentially saying that you can compare preferences and formulate them as probabilities with expected payoffs, both for good and bad outcomes. I recommend looking at it. If you've never heard of it, just a good Wikipedia article, give it a skim. But this is really that like we could do anything with expected utilities and fit that into human frameworks. And then there's kind of the idea that is so central to reinforcement learning that some people don't even think about it, which is like the notion of reward and making that number goes up. Go up means that your behavior is improving. This comes from psychology literature and operant conditioning, which is used for training the study of training animals with reward. Um, this was like from Skinner, and this transformed eventually into a notion of utility to go, which actually came from the analog circuits realm which people also wouldn't expect. You can find the link to that in the paper. All of these things we cite in this history and risks paper below. And then comes kind of RL ideas that are explicit into the math, things like the Bellman equation and the Markov decision process. The MDP is an experimental setup. The Markov decision process is the MDP, where tools like Bellman equation, which is a dynamic programming approach, can solve for optimal solutions in a kind of defined state action environment. This is what a lot of modern RL tools build off of, the fact that we can get optimal solutions if we set up the problem correctly. Here we're going to take a bit of a left field turn, but essentially there's a presumption that we can reduce preferences to pairwise preferences. The link back in time to the 50s is something called the Bradley-Terry model, which is a, probabil a probability that one preference will beat another in a pairwise fashion. This is the math that is used in the reward modeling of RLHF, and it was brought in in this Cristiano et al. paper that you hear about all the time. And this is here where the RL literature starts to turn away from optimality, but into approximate methods. There's a ton of links that we could include here. I, I put some of the core ideas like temporal difference learning, TD Gammon, which is from Tesoro et al., which is the First time a deep RL algorithm solved a game, and it was in backgammon, funnily enough, if you've ever played. And then the obvious things like DeepMind's DQM for Atari work and everything in the modern world where RL is working great in simulation. And then the last of these really come from this really recent work from InstructGPT, ChatGPT, Claude, which is scaling up these methods and showing that you can aggregate preferences from multiple labor, label, labelers. You actually get the preferences from data. Reinforcement learning doesn't manipulate the preferences, things with the base model and everything. There's more presumptions that we could probably list with recent work, but we're just trying starting to understand how these techniques are used in the real world. Here's a slide you can look at if you want to read through these in text. Again, please reference the paper if you want more context. But really, given all of these assumptions and presumptions, we should ask some questions on how do we address these? How do we understand the risk? With the base models, we should understand if different base models carry biases with them before we get to the preference data. 
places like OpenAI and Anthropic are not incentivized to compare base models of their competitors because it's really hard to train them with RLHF. It's hard to take that other base model and do this comparison with state-of-the-art resources, but we should be doing this. And then we should see how these kind of biases or potential risks come in at the base model, at the instruction tuned model, at the RL model, and after any safety filters are applied. We should be auditing each of them sequentially with this notion of preference. A lot of the data questions have been asked, which is like, whose preferences are we aggregating over? But there's a lot of other context questions that are really interesting, like does data from professional versus users, professionals as in people who are paid to collect data or users, people just using ChatGPT, does that change the preferences that are encoded in the model? Is pairwise preferences enough? There's early research that people are trying to understand fine-grained feedback. And then this question of who, what, where, what, what is this data? We don't know. More on that in another talk. Training. How does using these powerful RL optimizers extract information from a reward model? At the beginning of the process for training a reward model and collecting preference data, you write out a set of values that you want the people collecting the data to give. And the question is, does the model actually get the priorities that we set out at the beginning of the data collection process? No one knows, everyone does it, but it's never talked about. And then should we just be averaging? Again, so much of ML is built over averaging over batches of large data. Should we be averaging every domain equally? Should healthcare data be prioritized over some other sort of preference? Should we be cleaning this? I don't know, someone can answer that for me. So really what this comes down to is we should work on what a socio-technical, that's not the best word. Socio-technical is an overloaded term. What is a good reward model for each population of people that are going to be using language models? What does that mean? How do we better define and be transparent about our goals? And then how do we evaluate reward models for capabilities? Why does RLHF improve things like Alpaca, Val, and MT Bench? And really, do our reward models encode safety? Is that something that people are still doing on the training side of things? Thanks for watching. Reach out if you have any questions, and let's keep doing open science. Thank you.